Yes, I took an exit. I think that's a pretty scary thing to move from a high commission per year, to move away from that, to not know what's next. It was pretty daunting, I must say. But I also wasn't happy. So the cost of me to take that and just try was kind of exciting because staying in a high paying job that I didn't enjoy, that was eating away at me. What's up, Ivan? Good to have you on the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me along, Jazz. Yeah, this is awesome. Well, you and I, we got a chance to get to know one another uh, at the gym. We work out at the same place. There's a, a sauna, one of those barrel saunas, and we were in there and, and just started talking and, and really hit it off. And from that point on, I feel like you know our, our workout schedule was similar. We'd see each other in the gym a lot. You had me over to your place for your, you know, sauna cold plunge uh, circuit that you do. And, you know, we've just really uh, created a fun and new friendship. And so I thought it'd be fun to tell your story on the show. Thanks, man. I think uh, I heard once they said it's good to be the dumbest person in the room. And when I'm around (laughs) you, uh, I, I feel that. So it's probably the more I hang around you, the better. Well, that's super kind. But what I will tell you is I have found that in every person, that I have on this show and every person that I meet and hang out with, I learn something and it's generally pretty cool stuff, stuff that I don't know. People, people are so brilliant and they're so smart in their, you know, their own niche, their own industry, their own track. And I just want a glimpse of what that looks like. And your story is really cool because you're not from the U.S. You live here in the U.S. now, but, you know, you started a business uh, out in Australia and and you became, you know, really kind of like one of the premier people uh, in uh, real estate and in the brokerage industry. And uh, you are able to live just this killer lifestyle. So sometimes I bring people on because I want to talk about, you know, business and entrepreneurship. And sometimes I want to bring them on because I want to talk investing and strategy. And sometimes I want to bring them on because I want to talk, you know, story and and you know, life and the hacks that they've figured out. And in your case, we could talk about all three of them because you've done very well in each of them. But moreover than anything, you have a really cool lifestyle. And I'd love for people to hear it, hear how you prioritize it. Um, because anyone that is looking in from the outside is like, man, I wish I had a life like Ivan. No, I don't know, Justin. I appreciate the kind words. Um, yeah, oh, look, the brokerage business, for those who don't know, the real estate brokerage business can be an amazing business if you're in the top 5 or 10%. So for everyday real estate brokers around the country, whether in the US or Australia, it's pretty tough. But if you can crack the top 5 or 10%, it's extremely, you know, it, it pays very well. Um, and so I was fortunate to get into the real estate business at a young age in Sydney, Australia. Uh, for those who don't know, the Australian real estate market is, it's like a pot of gold. It's something that they talk about at dinner, breakfast, lunch. Uh, it's a topic of conversation everywhere. House prices are very high. Uh, so I was lucky to get into the industry at a young age. And I did, you know, a good 23 years as a broker and an owner of a brokerage, which is pretty well-known brokerage in Sydney, which still operates today, Jos. That's awesome. And how old were you when you got started? I started straight out of school in Australia, which is about 18 years old. Uh, wow. My father had a bad accident. Uh, he got burnt. Um, and I think that grew me up very quickly uh, to take my professional life quite serious. When most 18-year-olds would be having fun, um, I kind of, it grew me up very quickly because he was incapacitated to work. Uh, wow. So I fell into real estate. I wasn't good at anything else. And I just enjoyed it. I didn't really think about the money. I actually just loved serving people. I was earning $500 a week in my first job back in 1996 or 97. And uh, I worked for a premier real estate company in Sydney, which became a national brand. Uh, I excelled at that after a few years. I had some great mentors around me. Uh, We sold a lot in the inner city suburbs. And uh, there was an agent there who I looked up to who we started doing a lot of deals together. So then we set out and started our own brokerage called Bressick Whitney, which was my surname and his surname. Uh, The business grew. Uh, We went from three of us to 15 of us to, at its peak, it was nearly 150 staff in Sydney. 
Uh, that wow. was across, yeah, it was across five offices. We had some of Sydney's best brokers and some of the country's best brokers. And you're talking commissions, like if you're a good broker, if you're in that top 5% of brokerage uh, in Australia, you're you're basically riding between $3 million and $10 million in commission fees per year. So it's, it's a very lucrative business if you crack the top 1% or 2%. Wow. Now, um, Sydney is a much different market than most of Australia, right? I mean, that that's kind of like if you're going to be somewhere, that's the place to be, at least on the real estate front, right? Correct. Yep. Good one. Um, Sydney would be the equivalent of New York City yep. to America. So yep. that's the, 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 the real business capital of, of Australia, the highest average sale price, the most competitive real estate market. Uh, so it's kind of like the New York or Los Angeles or, yeah, in some ways, the Miami now of America. Okay. And mm -hmm. so when you were building this, so how old were you when you started your own brokerage? You got into the business right out of school and then you work for another firm and then you're like, you know what? I know this stuff. I could do this. I'll do it on my own. Let me start my own brokerage. Yeah, good question. We started in 2003 called Bresick Whitney. It was our own brand. We didn't know what the hell we were doing, but we were good brokers. And, you know, we worked damn hard. Like, you see, you see what my lifestyle is now, but what you haven't seen is the 18 years of, you know, six, 6 a.m. rises, 12 or 13 hour days. I should say that real estate brokerage, yes, it is lucrative if you crack the top 5%, but you're also talking your phone never stops, Justin. So mm -hmm. you're, you're on call seven days a week. Um, so that's what it was like. Um, we sell real estate different down under to what we do here in Texas and in America. It's very different. We have an auction system. Um, but, you know, I was doing 100 sales a year for probably about 15 years. Wow. And during that time, I became an executive. I did a lot of coaching, a lot of mentoring because the, it became more about the business than my own personal sales. Um, and along the way, you know, you invest in predominantly residential real estate because that's what I knew. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. So you had the brokerage, but you became a household name, right? Um, you know, Bresick Whitney, like people wanted to emulate what you were doing, model their business off of you, whether it be realtor or whether it be brokerage, right? And Correct. so you started this coaching program parallel. And um, I'm, I'm curious, is that one that you did on your own? Or was that still partnered with your your business partner on the on the brokerage side? And, and how did that end up doing compared to the brokerage? Yeah, I think it was, it's, it's completely independent. So I made a decision as I was nearing 40 years old, I'd been in real estate now 22 or 23 years, I'd made millions of dollars in selling houses and through dividends through the business. Plus, the value of the business had also grown. Um, so my wife, Texan, uh, who I met in Los Angeles, who lived in Australia with me for a few years, I, as I was nearing 40, I was kind of feeling like I was overworked. I'd lost the passion for selling houses. My, my net worth had obviously grown to a level where I felt I could probably do some other things here rather than sell houses seven days a week. Uh, I really was thinking about my health. Uh, we're all going to die one day, so I love creating wealth, but I'm also interested in, well, is this is that all it was going to be, like selling houses till I'm 70 and then retire? Like, And if it was, then I wanted to, you know, take my check and, and move on. Um, so, you know, with that, I made a decision to sell out of the business, exit Bresick Whitney, which, by the way, still runs Stain, is still an extremely successful business in Sydney, Australia today. Uh, I'm still friends with a lot of the guys back there, my former founder, uh, but I got a really nice check at the end of it. I felt it was probably, um, I felt as most people, you feel like you're underpaid. You feel like it could always be more, but it was a generous size check, which I've worked hard for. I then took that and then my wife and I moved back to the States because we wanted to start a family and she was from here and I was interested in living a different life. Yeah, that's awesome. And so that's really, I guess, when the coaching business began, because right. you had this opportunity. So, you know, you've got you've got cash in hand, you've done well, your net worth has grown over the years, you've been getting distributions every year, you get a big, you know, check at the end to kind of cut ties, uh, get you out of 
the the grind, I'll call it, which, you know, most people at some point, the grind catches them, right? And, and they're burnout and they want to move on. They want to move up to maybe what they would consider higher quality work or less demanding um, on your time type of work. And so you pivoted to coaching, you work with a lot of people, I think you're pr primarily your, your biggest client base is still in Australia, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I read this thing that said that it's not burnout that gets people, it's it's a lack of passion. Because if you're really passionate about something, you'll work 16 hours a day. Um, so I think I'd lost the passion for selling homes. I didn't, I didn't want to be doing that at 50. I thought if I'm still doing this at 50 years old, that's not a great life. And, and mm. that for me, even if it meant more money, that was not something that I was prepared to sacrifice. Um, so... You're right. I sold out of the business. I exited. I moved to the States just before COVID. I had some options. I thought, you know, the real estate market was such, as we spoke about, was so good that decade. So I had some options to flip houses, buy lots of smaller property and manage them. Uh, any type of sales role I was, I could have been quite competent at. Um, but I just naturally fell back into what I knew, which was guiding and helping and you know, uh, pre predominantly real estate brokers and Australia is where my brand is. Australia is where I'm known. And that was the lowest hanging fruit. And thanks to technology, like today, that was an easy, easy transition into advising and coaching. Here we are five years later, I'm still doing the same thing. Yeah, you know, and it's nice because when we spoke last, you had said, hey, coaching covers all my bills and then some. So, you know, life is good. You make great money. You haven't had to dip into your, you know, the, the exit dollars, the money that you've accumulated, your net worth. So your net worth's not dropping. When a lot of people sell their company, um, what we find is very normal with them is they go from being the richest person to having the most money they've ever had to actually these feelings of scarcity and feeling like they're the poorest that they've ever been because their money dwindles every time they spend it. So now the bank account or the investment accounts become less and less until they figure out how to cover their lifestyle expenses. And so it's, it's a fascinating experience where someone goes from being truly the wealthiest they have ever been in their life, but feeling at the same time like they don't have enough money, that money is you know, dwindling every day, every week, every month. And so what's nice about you is you have your coaching business that covers all that. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you can keep growing that net worth. Um, but what I'd love to talk about are, you know, some of the, like, I, I would call them successes that you've had, yet failures also, like what on the investment front, on the business front, I'd love to get into for our audience, what have you done well that people should copy and what have you totally messed up that people should, you know, just listen to you and not make the same mistakes? Yeah, there, there's some good ones. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot that, you know, I could share that's what not probably not what not to, that you shouldn't do rather than what you should do. Look, being a residential broker and with the, with the strength of the Australian real estate market, it was it was something that was quite, you know, it was something that had paid, you know, it was, it was a good avenue for me to create wealth because we knew the type of property to buy, we could manage it through the business and five or 10 years would pass by. And as you know, the capital growth grows. And so it was a good way to build wealth. Um, so I think there's a shadow to that. One is it's great to build it, but then I'm not really diversifying across other wealth class, other asset classes. Mm. Um, so I think that was a good, for the first 20 years, I think residential real estate really served me well. I'm finding the last five or seven years, my tunnel vision for residential, you know, single family homes, if you want to call it, that's what you call it here in the US, uh, as you know, has taken a bit of a beating in the last couple of years, especially here in Austin. Um, so I think my lack of diversity has probably cost me the last few years, uh, but it, it was certainly great for the first 20 years. Uh, I think also when you're making good cash like I was in sales commissions, it's very easy to go, oh, there's some shares that we should buy because I heard that. So you go buy some shares, I'll buy $100,000 worth of shares, and in two months later, they're worth 50000 So they dropped in they dropped in value 50%. So there was a few of those along the way. Mm. Uh, I think in the business, from a business sense, 
Uh, we overinvested in the business. When I look back at it, I actually think it probably could have been more profitable over those 20 years and we probably could have taken more dividends over those years and, and what have you. Uh, I think now I've never seen an interest rate market like this. You know, I'm 45 years old. So it's like for the 25 years that I was in real estate, Justin, the interest rates have always been under 3% pretty yeah. much. So now this interest rate market, whether you're in Australia or whether in the US, I've never seen, I've never had to participate as a landlord, you know, as an investor, I've never had to participate in this. So this has definitely thrown, you know, we say a cat amongst the pigeons in Australia. It's really, you know, it's really made me consider, well, what is my wealth creation plan? And to your point, yes, I took an exit, exit of the business check and it was great. It is very, um, I think that's a pretty scary thing to move from a high, like a high salary or a high commission per year to move away from that to not know what's next. It was pretty daunting, I must say, but I also wasn't happy. So the cost of me to take that and just try was as as daunting as that was 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 kind of exciting because staying in a high paying job that I didn't enjoy, that was eating away at me. So for me, it was a really easy decision to go in. I have had to work on my craft in the coaching space. I've spent a lot of time reading, meeting great people like yourself, looking at other asset classes, sitting back, watching. Uh, Since I've been here, I've invested in California, Texas, and Florida. That's been quite interesting because they're all a little bit different, as you know. Um, So there's been some do's and don'ts. I don't know if that covers it, but oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm still you trying know, to figure it out, Justin. Oh, it's it's awesome to to you know just hear some of the shares that you've had and and what you're willing to talk about. And hmm. you know, I, I think about um, what's cool is hmm. you looked the money that you are making a lot of money right in the eyes and said, you know what, I don't need you anymore. I've got things that are more important than you. I'm going to move. I'm going to make less at least to start out um, because that's unknown but I'm going to do it because I don't want to be a slave to the money anymore. And I don't want to be a slave to the job or the business anymore. And I think most entrepreneurs become a slave to their business and they have a hard time leaving. They're totally shackled. And those that are not entrepreneurs, they most certainly are a slave to their job, to, you know, the position they have to the corporate ladder and moving up. And so most people, you know, they become that slave. They become that, uh, you know, it's the, the golden handcuffs, whether it's due to the money, due to, you know, being used to the lifestyle, uh, due to safety and security, something. And I love that you were able to break free because that is hard. That There's a mental aspect to it, but there's also a physical experiential part of like, you're just going to make less money, most likely at the beginning, at least. Uh, and you have to you have to kind of, in your case, man up to that and then just pull the trigger anyway, right? Yeah, because if you think about it, in the year nine, in, in 2019, I would have made the equivalent of about $2 million Australian dollars in commissions that year and through, my, through the business, which is equivalent to about 1.3, 1.4 US. And I said to myself, if I can just find a new job or a new vocation, a new career, whatever, in the US and make a couple hundred thousand, I'll be happy. And so I had psychologically prepared myself for that. Uh, and as it turned out, my first year, I probably did earn 150 or 200,000. But the coaching business year on year has improved. It's been great for me because it allows me to only work about 25 hours a week. And I, and I, I put a big value on time, particularly now that I'm in my, well into my 40s. I have a two-year-old son. Uh, time with my family and time in my health. And time to just chill. Like before our interview, I, I meditated for half an hour. I've, you know, I don't have those pressures that I had for 25 years. Uh, and I've got to say, you know, that was, that's, that's, an, I wouldn't take that back. People have said, oh, you know, are you sure you made the right decision leaving the business? You built 20 years of building the business and then you leave. And I said, I've got to say, starting it was the best thing I ever did because it made me wealthy and I enjoyed it. But also selling out and moving to this next phase of my life was the second best thing I've ever done. So it's not for everyone, but I certainly understand why people don't want to leave their high paying job because it's scary. And as we make more money, we also have higher spending habits. And that unknown is a real, it's, it's uncomfortable for people, but I've got to say, I've been through it and 
I'm glad I went through it. And it does take courage. But now the lifestyle, which you, you, when we started, you said you've got a great lifestyle. I have a fantastic lifestyle. I've created that. Um, you know, and I'm lucky that I had got, had a, I'd made those millions and I had those properties. Um, certainly could have more, could have less, but I'm, I have gratitude for what I have each day. So, yeah. Well, I love it. And, and I definitely want to get into some lifestyle talk today. But before we do that, I just it's so admirable that you were able to, to pull the trigger there. Uh, because that is really tough. Our stories are very similar in the fact that, um, you know, I got to a point where my passive income uh, exceeded what I was earning, you know, both uh, from a business standpoint, and from like, you know, I had a business that, you know, had a lot of uh, independent contractor pay 1099 pay. And so um, my friends were like, Hey, you're gonna leave that you're gonna stop doing that, just because you have the passive income, like, are you crazy? You could double up. You'd make twice as much. And and I said, the goal for me has never been to make more money. The goal for me is to completely own my time. So I don't need more money. I need I need more time. And so I love that you're able to do that. I love that you prioritize that. Um, and so same thing for me. I just had to figure out how do I cover our expenses? I don't need more than that. Now, the irony, which I know you've experienced this as well, is once you have time, it's amazing all the stuff you can think of and like all the ways that you can figure out how to, you know, compound wealth, make more money, do all these things, because I make way more today than I ever did then by a landslide. And it's really because I have the time and the space. And and like you said, um, 25 hours or so is the perfect cadence or time for you. Yeah, 25 to 30. I'm the same way. I can't not work. Working is fun, but I want it to be on my terms, you know, my schedule, when I want to work, doing things that I really enjoy. And I think as long as that's, the, if I can pick my cadence, which, yeah. you know, for me is like Tuesday or Thursday. I love working Tuesday or Thursday. And then I love having extended weekends with family and friends uh, and travel and, you know, all the things that we've talked about. But if I can have the cadence that I want in a meaningful, you know, subject matter or material with people that I love being around, I'm going to work till the day I die, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I think that time one, look, I think in your 30s, and you would probably, you may have thought the same thing. In your 30s, you don't really think about the fact that we may not live forever. You're just having a good time and you're trying to make as much money as you can. But I found that from 35 to 40, I was really considering my life. The more I read on stoicism and some other things, and I thought, well, hang on, there's no guarantee that we're going to be here in three years, five years, 15 years, or 30 years. Um, that really changed and shifted my way of thinking and how I wanted to design my life. Um, do you? Did you consider that? Do you consider, you know, your lifespan? And, and I mean, you must if you think about time. Yeah, 100%. You know, when I was grinding it out, and by the way, like you, I put in crazy hours, I worked seven days a week, I, you know, did the whole entrepreneurial trek. Um, and, and for me, I'm glad that I did that, because I know if I ever needed to, you know, find that work ethic again, I could find it, I use that work ethic differently, more strategically, more in focused uh, time frames with a lot of good boundaries and guardrails around my time. So I'm glad that I've utilized and, and you know, built those muscles and those skills. Um, but at the same time, I remember thinking in my 30s, I'm working way too many hours. This is not sustainable. When I have a family, I can't be like this. This is going to be a detriment to them. So I need to recognize that this is a season. I want it to be a short season. And I want to figure out how to get out of this season where the business still hums even without me putting these hours. And if that's not the case, if I can't do it, then I need to transition out of this business and find something that I can do that with. Yeah, well done. I mean, I see that you've created a really good lifestyle. And the fact that you work three day or you focus on three day a week work, work weeks, I mean, there's just, there's something to be said now about time. Like you can, you can, you can go work more hours and maybe make more money, but like, what are you going to do with it in the end, you know? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people say to me, or I put to people, if you could have $20 million and be unfit, so not healthy, okay, so overweight or whatever you want to call it, whatever that is, or if you could have $5 million or $3 million or $7 million and be fit and healthy, which one would you take? I would take the less money and be fit and healthy because I want to live for a long time but just li and live well. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't, as you know, I mean, we, we both train at the same gym. You can't buy a good body. 
It's not something you can, you can't, you can't become really successful or CEO or sell a company for two hundred million dollars and buy something that's just going to give you a fit body that you're proud of. So, I turned forty six this year, and I'd say my health and my health and fitness goals are, if not more important than my wealth creation uh, goals, but they're certainly on the same path. They're just as important as each other. Yeah, and I love that you're focused on that. And and for the record. You are one of the fittest people that I know, one of the fittest people at our gym. And and there are a lot of youngsters, a lot of very fit people. So uh, you've got, you know, great competition. And and you and I, you know, we're in there, we're hitting it hard. We're hanging out afterwards. We're both getting injured, you know, doing the stuff that we do as well. Not necessarily uh, always from lifting, but just as you get older, things happen. You can't do stuff the way that you used to do them. So I know you just got over an injury. I'm battling, uh, you know, a, a, a three torn ligaments in my ankle playing volleyball, not lifting. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, it's, it's such a great reminder of like, oh man, health is so important when you don't have it. It's you, you can take it so for granted when you don't have it, you're like, oh, I miss what it was like just to walk normal or, you know, to go play sports or to go ride a bike. Um, but that's why it's important that we, we continue this. And I'm curious if you could outline what it is that you do. I think a lot of people get value from hearing, what your routine looks like to stay as fit as you stay, like, you know, from a working standpoint, working out um, uh, supplements, um, you know, everything, cold plunging, sauna, you know, all the stuff that we've done together. I'd love for people to hear what you're doing because you've got the hack. You're almost 46 and you look like you could be 25. Thank you. That's a very nice compliment. Uh, I think it's the, the health journey is just like creating wealth. There's so many similarities. Like it doesn't happen overnight, as you know. It's incremental, like little shifts. It's sharpening the sword always. Um, I've always been in my health and fitness, but I can say that as I've got in my 40s, I'm actually healthier and fitter than I was in my 30s and 20s. But there's so much information available now. But if I was to summarize it short, like quickly for the group, I would say there's kind of four or five main things. And this is what I coach as well for a lot of my brokers. Now, you've got to remember, a lot of my brokers are making three, five. I have a broker who does $9 million a year in Sydney, who's my number one broker, who's the number two in Australia. Um, and it's interesting, so many things that I talk about, you know, I'm trying to encourage these guys who are in high-pressure roles, make lots of money, lots of cash money, or lots of pre-tax money, um, on how they can really perform better that's really what i'm interested in so that's why the health and fitness goes hand in hand with wealth creation and sales and so on uh to keep it simple look i, I, I like uh, res resistance training i think is a must so you, you're not going to you know you, we, we need to build muscle particularly as we get older that's number one uh, diet and health uh, diet and nutrition is a big one so what's in your fridge what are we eating how much water are we consuming Fruit, veggies, animal-based diet. That's where I've been for the last several years. Supplements, which I think are important, you know, whether it's provitamins, it's, you know, zinc, it's magnesium, what, whatever. You know, some supplements. Uh, rest, which is a big one, uh, which I encourage a lot of people. I mean, sleep is really important. The science is there. We need to be having at least seven hours a night. Good sleep too. Good quality sleep. So that's important. Um, certainly some cardio. You know, I don't do a lot of it, but, you know, walking, I ran this morning on the bike, that's important. Uh, so I think they're kind of, you know, the big shift for me, Jazz, was about two and a half years ago. I eliminated alcohol completely. So I wasn't a big drinker, but I, I, I knew it didn't serve me even the two glasses of wine or the three beers. I knew it just didn't serve me. And it just didn't, it was, it, it, it counteracted what I was interested in. So when my wife was pregnant, when she stopped drinking, I said, I'm going to stop drinking as well. And I never went back. And it's, that, that has been one of the biggest life hacks. Like that's where I've seen the most gains. That's why my sleep's gotten better. And this is all while I've had a one-year-old and a two-year-old, which we know is difficult to get good sleep. Um, so I think they're kind of the main ones. I think for busy people, you know, busy, productive people, holidays, are you just have to holiday. Like you have to take breaks. You have to pack a bag, leave your home, leave your environment, leave your routine and just go somewhere. It doesn't matter where you go, whether it's an expensive holiday or it's to Mexico for a few days or whatever it is. Uh, I think holidays are a really good thing to reset. Then there's the other things too, which is the recovery, which you mentioned. So like we, you and I sauna, we ice bath, 
you know, I get a massage every two weeks. I get a foot massage every other week. You know, those little things, you know, and then like today, for example, I did yoga. So I love yoga. I've been doing yoga for a couple of years now. So I know it sounds like a lot, but it kind of, a lot of it becomes habit. And you've got to remember, I'm only working 25 hours a week in this format on online. So I kind of prioritize those things. And interestingly, when you don't drink, you sleep better. You have more hours in the day. I meditate daily, which gives me more energy. And so that's kind of where I balance. So look, I am cognizant that I do have more time than most professionals. So I can't say go spend four hours a day on your health and fitness because that's just not possible. But if they've got an hour, they should be spending that in the right times. And then on weekends, that should be recovery. So look, I keep it really simple. The science is there. And, you know, for everyone who's on, you know, on, on social media, it's pretty easy to find out what works and what doesn't, even though it does get confusing at times. The messaging. Yeah, but- that is such a great summary, and we couldn't mm-hmm. agree more. Uh, and I'm just going to go out on a limb here because yes. I know we're going to have a bunch of people that listen to this and say, wow, I'd love to learn more from you, Ivan. Mm-hmm. I have a funny feeling that even though your primary client base are realtors uh, in Australia, specifically likely in Sydney, um, I think you probably have a market of potential clients that you haven't even tapped into yet that are working in various different industries that all the same lessons, uh, all the same tactics and strategies apply to just perfectly. Even though your background's in real estate, I actually don't think the the skills that you have to share uh, are, are limited to just that industry. So I, I'm just saying that we'll see what happens as as things evolve. But uh, I, I can see you getting it, into a lot of different is, spaces. Yeah, well, it's funny you say that. Um, a real estate broker is a, is a lifestyle decision. And so if you think about it, if I'm advising them, it's a bit like life coaching. Mm-hmm. Because so you're saying, well, I think there's a lot of people out there who need some life coaching. That's right. You know, they, they, they earn good income or they want to perform better at work. What can they do outside work or how can they handle that stress, money problems, whatever it is? Um, so in some ways, I am a life coach to the real estate industry, and I've had other people. My sister's very successful in the fashion business, and I'm regularly advising her. Um, so yeah, I hear what you're saying. It is it is health and fitness and lifestyle. You know, c- comes into it definitely. Well, there's no doubt. And and what I also love about you is you are not only making decisions that are best for your lifestyle. I mean, cutting out alcohol, you know, focusing on all these other things that that we're talking about. Um, But you're also then living lifestyle in the place that you call home. And so I've been in your home, you have a gorgeous home, your home is at one of the highest points here in Austin, overlooks the city, overlooks just beautiful, you know, green belts and green area. the, the view, the home is strikingly beautiful. The views are breathtaking. And so you are maximizing not just uh, the investing that you're doing, but the lifestyle that you can live as well. So I just want to, you know, uh, recognize that and share that with you, because I think sometimes people get caught up in this, this idea that, you know, they, they can't have their dream house, or they can't splurge in that area of their life. And if you do it right, you can invest in a way where it can actually be good on on you know the scorecard, if you will, on your personal financial um, you know balance sheet. But you're also able to get good quality life. It's great for entertaining. It's great for your own like mental and physical healing. And you've done that really well. Thank you. Yeah, that was important. I mean, we moved from California. I lived in the hills in a beautiful home, but the attraction to Austin was the lifestyle component, the outdoors. Like you said, it's really green. It's peaceful where I live. There's no traffic. There's no airplanes. I can think. Um, I spend a lot of time reading. I read about 30, 30 30-odd books a year, um, which is something that I'm really passionate about. So this is the ideal place where I'm further away from downtown but close enough to downtown if I need it. Yeah, that's amazing. Thanks, man. So um, what I would say is you've got a great life. You figured a lot of things out. I hope there there are people today that can can take from you some of these lessons, some of these habits, and implement them into their life. Uh, so thank you for sharing all that you shared. Where can people find out more about you and learn about you know what you yeah, have? And just just before we finish, Jazz, I mean, I have I have invested in residential real estate here in the U.S. 
And like I said, that's been a pretty turbulent time the last couple of years. So I would say that half of the properties that I bought are worth less than what I paid for them. <laughs> so right. that's not, I'm not, you know, in terms of investment or that, that, that channel, that wealth creation channel, I wouldn't say that that was the most wisest thing. But now I think I'm in, I have to hold on and, you know, hope that in time that they're going to appreciate. And I guess I'm a kind of passive real estate investor now. Um, they haven't jumped into the sky, but I guess like my health and fitness, I guess you just, you, you take it, markets go up and down just like everything. And I, I guess I hope I hold on. I don't go and panic sell. And I hope that in time that that portfolio of several or eight, I just closed on another one, number nine, uh, appreciating value over the years, but I think it could be a little while away with these interest rates. Anyway, to answer your question, uh, I've got a website. It's probably the best way. It's just my name, ivanbreskick.com. They can contact me there. I'm happy to help. I hope it's been of, of use, uh, but I've certainly got more to learn than to, to teach, I think. Well, you're so humble. I love hearing that. And by the way, we could do an episode just on on this stuff. I mean, it's so so much fun for me, but uh, you're right. We're in a, we're in an interesting season, an abnormally high interest rate season. Mm -hmm. However, if you look at you know globally of you know the U.S. and interest rates, it's actually not that high. It's just really high as of you know the last what twenty years or so. Correct. Yeah. Um, and and so the fascinating thing about it is a lot of people are in trouble or they're going to be in trouble because they didn't use the right type of debt. Um, they use floating rates, variable rates, uh, no rate caps, um, short terms, bridge loans, um, didn't lock in long term rates with with good fixed, um, you know, uh, right I, uh, rates and, you know, uh, term, you know, it's, it's tough seeing what is happening and what's going to continue to happen. But what I'm going to say is it's an opportunity for many of us. And if you're not forced to sell in the long run, it's going to work out. You just have to be able to sit on it. You know, if you if you've got enough cash flow, that's why I always tell people I love cash flow. Do you risk any deal? Because if you have enough cash flow, you're never forced to sell. You can sit it out and you can just wait and you can time the market. Um, and, and I think that's fantastic. A lot of people don't have that luxury. They're going to be forced to sell. But then those of us sitting on the sidelines waiting for a good opportunity, we're likely going to see a lot more opportunities in the next you know few years. So just want to put that on everyone's radar. Yeah, right. No, fantastic. And I completely agree with you. Like I considered selling one or two of the properties in Austin that I bought recently. And I just had them looked at by two brokers and both brokers gave me potential sale prices of 10% less than what I paid. And to your point, it was like, well, I don't need to. They're leased. Um, they certainly, you know, I certainly, I have to add to them each month a little bit, which I'm in a fortunate position where I can to cover the interest rates because the rent doesn't cover the interest rates and tax. Um, but yeah, look, I think it's panic selling is not something that I want to do. And I guess they're the decision I made. I hold on tight and wait for wait for better days, Justin. Yeah, well, better days will come at some point. But the other thing is, the other you know point to evaluate is ten percent. So, for example, let's say um, I've got uh, you know a traditional IRA, uh, I can pay a penalty of ten percent to you know get that money out. Um, you know, I can I can pay you know I can roll it over into a Roth IRA. I mean, there are things I can do where I have to say, hey, short term, I take a ten percent hit. Long term is there the likelihood that I'm going to actually do better, make more money. And I think in, in that scenario, all day, every day. And so if you're in a position where you can hold out on real estate, that may make the most sense. But for someone that really, like in your case, you don't have to sell because you have the means to cover it. But at whatever point, you just don't want the mental stress or burden of feeling like you always have to cover it. To take a 10% hit to just get rid of something, to get a bunch of cash so you can, you can take yeah. a loss, but it can make you more in the long run, that actually could be the right play in the future. And I think it's good for people to consider that too and not feel like you should only sell if you're making money. Sometimes taking a 10% hit to make you know, 20, 30, 40% more in something else is totally worth it. Yeah, it's a good point. I've actually sold a couple of properties at a loss over the years because I just wore the loss. I knew it happened and move on. Uh, but it, I think it's a really interesting time we're in because, you know, we spoke about in the sauna, like you've got uh, between property tax, tenants that sometimes don't pay rent or can be, you know, 
I just fixed it. I had a repair yesterday, which I fixed on one of the small houses, a $500 plumbing repair. So they mount up. So it's not it's not as attractive as what it was in the 2000s and the 2010 decade. Property was fantastic because you knew that as you slept and as, as months went by, the asset was just appreciating. Now, the cost to hold these assets has gone up. The, the, the chance of capital growth over the next five years is certainly low with these interest rates. So for someone like me, it's a really interesting time because that's all I've ever known. Uh, so I'm really, you know, I love talking to you and others about well, what are the other asset classes? What are the returns? What are the risks? And kind of, you know, how much, you know, what sort of, what's the upkeep? How much, how much hassle is there? Because being an, a resident, being a single family home owner, like I do, I have several properties, I can tell you it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's it's been a really good conversation and I'm sure there's others who are feeling like that right now and, but, I, but I'm also, I certainly, as a broker who's been in real estate for 25 years, something I know very well, I also know that markets go up and markets go down no matter what you're in. That's so right. anyway, that's how it is. Well, Ivan, I appreciate you being so open and honest. Uh, you're, you're, you're an open book. Uh, and I think it's cool that, uh, you know, sometimes people on podcasts will position and posture and you're like, hey, before we, you know, before we end things here today, let me tell you about you know, just life in general, real life and investing and kind of where I'm at. And I think that's so cool that that vulnerability, I think, is is probably one of the greatest keys to why you see a lot of repeat business and a lot of um, people that want to be your clients. And I think that's really cool. Thank you. So thanks. Um, I love ending every episode with a simple question to our audience. So those of you listening, those of you watching, uh, here's the question. What's one step that you can take today to move towards financial freedom and move towards living a life that you truly desire that's on your terms? Most people live a life by default. I really encourage everyone to live a life by design. So what's one thing you can take from Ivan today to get you closer to what your ideal life by design is? Thanks, and we'll catch you next week.